Hi, Nicole. It's really nice to meet you. Uh, Hi, nice to meet you too. Uh, can you say your full name and uh, where you're from? Uh, my name is Nicole Benedek. I'm an assistant professor in the Material Science and Engineering Department at Cornell University. Um, I'm originally from Melbourne, Australia. That's where I did my undergrad and my uh, PhD. Mm. Uh, and then I and then I moved to the UK for a postdoc, and then eventually to the US. So I've been a bit of a nomad. Wow, you know, I I kind of could hear some accent, yes. but I didn't know where <laughs> where that came from. I see. Um, so, can you tell me something about you know what inspired you to be in the field that you are in and growing up? Did you have role models? Yeah, um, a lot of people ask that question. So I don't know what it was that inspired me to become a scientist. Just from my sort of earliest memories, that's what I wanted to do, mm. um, and. It's very cliche. I had a chemistry kit growing up and uh, all that stuff and then that's what I, I went to college and did my science degrees. Um, I actually started uh, doing experiments when I was doing uh, my PhD so I was uh, making molecular crystals um, but I was doing theory at the same time and uh, theory was I was better at it and it was uh, less smelly than working with a lot of chemicals so that's what I um, that's what I continued on I see that's that's good so you didn't have any teachers who inspired you in high school or college or I had um, so I had a couple of English teachers actually in high school that were um, really fantastic and I learned a lot about how to uh, think and formulate arguments from them and then in That's so fascinating yeah then in college um, I, in college I, I just because my uh, undergrad department didn't have uh, any sort of theory courses but um, I had a couple of professors who of knew my interests and were willing to let me do kind of independent study and I really uh, appreciated that and they they helped me a lot and um, provided really great guidance. That's wonderful so can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now what mm -hmm. is your research? So my research area is theoretical and computational material science so basically I try to understand uh, how the properties of materials arise from the way the atoms are arranged uh, at the atomic scale. Um, so an example of that would be the difference between uh, graphite and diamond. Mm -hmm. So graphite is uh, black, it's uh, very soft. Uh, diamond is uh, transparent and it's one of the hardest known materials. Uh, chemically they're identical, they're both just carbon. Um, but their difference in properties comes from uh, their different crystal structures. So diamond is cubic and uh, graphite is hexagonal. Um, and so basically I tried to uh, elucidate these structure property relationships and um, use them to solve various problems. So you know, how do we make um, a battery that can uh, charge much faster or how do we uh, find a battery that will allow you to drive your car for longer or um, you know how can we change the way that heat flows through materials uh, can we manipulate heat flow um, questions like that fascinating so what do you think the ride ha how has the ride been so far the ride has been uh, amazing I have I feel incredibly lucky um, I've gotten to work with some amazing people and worked in really incredible places and I'm just incredibly grateful. It's been uh, an amazing ride. That's wonderful. So tell us something about, you know, what are the kinds of things that you find most rewarding, you know? Most rewarding? Um, various things. So talking to people, just talking to people about science is really rewarding and just bouncing ideas um, off, off people and sort of sitting with someone and not really knowing where you're going on a problem at the beginning but then sort of by working together working something out or discovering something interesting. 
you can um, figure something out together. Yeah, right? yeah. And working with students as well, sort of related to that, is uh, helping students find their own way um, with problems when, uh, particularly with my grad students, when they first start, they're unfamiliar with this sort of research area and um, they need a lot of help getting going, but then in the end, they sort of, they take it over and then they're teaching me and that's really satisfying. That's wonderful. So uh, tell me, as a scientist, have you ever encountered any impediments and what kinds of impediments were they if you did encounter them? Impediments. Um, well, we are hoping that this thing would also help future scientists. So if you actually give some example of some kinds of difficulties that you have had along the way or Mm -hmm. or, or do you not remember anything major? So one of the impediments that I had uh, that we were talking about earlier was this idea of um, not understanding that uh, struggling was part of the process to finding a solution. Um, right. I think when I was younger, when I was in undergrad, I thought that uh, if I didn't get it straight away, then that meant I mm -hmm. was stupid and I wasn't any good and clearly I shouldn't be, you know, I should be doing something else. Um, and it took a while to learn that, no, actually, um, sometimes things just take a little bit right. of work to master. Um, and it took a while to learn that, but uh, it's definitely an impediment if you think the way that I used to think. Um, and if you uh, want to be successful in science, then I think you need to find a way to overcome that. Right. So have you ever encountered any gender bias in sciences? Yes. Um, Can you give some examples? Yeah. Uh, so in a meeting uh, with lots of people and uh, I'll say something and it's kind of ignored and then someone else will say it and everyone nods like, ah, oh, yeah, that's a really good idea or whatever. That has happened um, on more than one occasion and at the first time it happened, I, I actually looked around uh, at the other people that were present, like, I just, I just <laughs> didn't I just that. say that? <laughs> yeah, I just said that. Um, and now it's sort of less uh, jarring when it happens, but no less uh, frustrating. Right, right. I know exactly what you're saying because this happens to everybody, all of us. Yeah. So yeah. it's a very common thing. Yep. So what advice would you give to young women who are wanting to be like you? <laughs> um, it, you know, I wasn't, uh, when I kind of started on, um, when I started on this path, I didn't have any, I just really, I just really wanted to do science. And so no matter what happened, I just kept going. So, um, you know, I moved, I moved twice. Um, and so, I don't, know, I don't have a sort of cogent, like one line, like d here is this recipe for uh, guaranteed uh, success, but just keep going and- Keep having fun. Keep having fun. And it's not always fun, but that's okay. And, um, Please don't, please don't get this idea in your head that um, if you're struggling, then it means you shouldn't be doing it because that's, that's not true. You know, there has been a lot of discussion about work-life balance, mm -hmm. and especially for scientists. So any thoughts on that issue? Uh, so I... Uh, I think like a lot of my colleagues, um, and as you were saying, we work a lot. Um, so it's not a nine to five sort of Monday to Friday job. Um, 
and it can be difficult to switch off sort of work mode sometimes um, but it's still really important to find something that you can do that is sort of downtime. Um, I sometimes when I'm not working I feel like I should be and that's a bad habit that um, I probably need to break uh, but um, yeah it's, it's okay to be working um, a lot but there also needs to be downtime and I've also noticed myself actually that if I don't take a break then it impairs my ability to right. do more work I just right. don't I become really inefficient um, so even you know to keep going it's important to take a break um, and step back sometimes absolutely so have you had role models I mean any scientific role model There's no one that uh, I have kind of um, like pinned up on my pin board at home. Right. <laughs> um, I I read the the biography of um, J D Bernal. So um, he was a crystallographer, um, sort of in the 30s, 40s, and set up sort of one of the first uh, crystallography departments. Um, so crystallography is the study of crystal structures, and uh, which is related to my work. Um, and he created um, a really inv amazing environment um, that people for people to work in. Um, and a lot of very successful people came out of his lab, including a lot of uh, very successful women that went on to make sort of pioneering, groundbreaking discoveries um, in crystallography and. Um, and I like that because sort of in those days that I don't think that maybe that wasn't uh, the norm, but for him to set up an environment like that at that time uh, was really cool. Mm -hmm. So did that book actually talk about how he created this environment? Uh, I think he was very, um, very generous with his ideas and with mm -hmm. his time. I see. Um, so he was a good mentor? I, I, yeah. And yeah, I think that was the, the main thing, that he was uh, a good scientific mentor. Let's see. So any quotations you like about <laughs> science? Uh, it's not one about science specifically, but uh, the philosopher Wittgenstein said, when you're philosophizing, you have to descend into primeval chaos and feel at home there. Uh, and I liked that because uh, sometimes uh, that's what doing science feels like, just getting completely lost in a problem, having uh, no idea how to solve it or when you're going to solve it, wandering around kind of in the wilderness trying different things and things aren't really working but it's okay because it's part of, it's part of solving the problem. Absolutely. So what do you think um you'd like to say to young people about what the future of science looks like? Oh, I wish I had a crystal ball what the future of science looks like. Um, no, I, don't, I don't know what the future of science looks like. Um, I, I think it will probably... Um, I mean, scientists, I think, are going to continue to play an important role in solving or helping to solve um, some of the challenges that are facing society. Um, I think scientists are getting better at um, sort of working with with the public and saying this is what our uh, work is and sort of being a bit more forthcoming uh, about what they do um, and yeah I think that that will hopefully sort of con continue and, and get better. So I take this as you telling the young people yes be come to science it's a great field to come be. Come to science it is a great it is a great field um, to be in I, I, I don't know uh, of 
mean, it, it's a field where, so science is not just um, academic science that's done in universities. Um, there are scientists across, you know, all across uh, the private sector as well, working in various industries. Um, but it's, it's something where you're always learning. That's one of the, the best things about it. It's, you know, at the end of your career, you're not going to be working on the same thing that you were doing at the beginning of your career. And that's really built into the process that you have to be um, continuously learning and uh, picking up new things. And it's always challenging. Um, so it is great. Yes, come to science. I totally agree. Well, thank you so much, Nicole. Mm -hmm. It was so wonderful talking to you. It's nice to talk to you too. <laughs>